Welcome, aloha, thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. We are really glad you're here. And we are going to show our appreciation and gratitude by sharing with you some thoughts of some really insightful and well-versed, knowledgeable people on the right-wing majority of the present US Supreme Court, the risks, the harm, and the background. We have with us former law school dean, Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii, Avi Seufer, personal friend, and whose greatest gift, benefit, and attribute to my personal knowledge is being married to Marlene, who is mm -hmm. one of the truly most gifted people and filmmakers I have ever seen. She did one on the Brown versus Board of Education at 50 that would make you stop, pause, and watch it again, and possibly tear up. It's moving, it's powerful, look for it. Marlene has put together just an amazing thought piece on film. Troy Andrade from the Richardson School of Law, an awarded, multiple awarded, and frequent professor there, well-respected, well-loved by the students, by the community, by the administration, and anybody who has any sense of people, as are Sandra Sims, retired judge, wonderful person, author, now working on her second book to help us learn what life on the bench has made available for her in wisdom and understanding. And Louise Ng, one of our leading women's rights advocates, one of the Women Lawyers Foundation founders and leaders, and one of my and many of our very, very favorite people, as are all of these people on today's session. So who would like to start us off? The right-wing majority of the U.S. Supreme Court. Avi, you're the constitutional law professor because you take a constitutional almost every day. I, uh, I have lots to say about this uh, amazing concurring opinion by yes. Justice Edmonds of our Supreme Court. Uh, but I am really anxious to hear from others. I can go on and on, as any of my students and colleagues could tell you. But uh, I'll, I'll bat clean up here. <laughs> well, Chuck, you want me to start? I can jump in and just give a little broad picture of the lawsuit that happened that sort of instigated this conversation. Okay, that's a good way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Please we do, because a... Avi thought we were giving him an intentional pass. We're actually just moving him <laughs> from lead up to clean up in the batting order. Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, Let's hear so, so here in Hawaii and across the United States, there's been a lot of lawsuits that have been filed um, regarding what people often call climate change litigation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so here in Hawaii, there was a lawsuit that was filed in uh, on Oahu in circuit court, state circuit court, um, by the city and county of Honolulu against a lot of uh, oil companies. Mm -hmm. um, and all of their claims, I teach torts, all of their claims are tort claims that they're alleging against the defendants. Um, defendants filed a um, motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction, uh, personal jurisdiction. That made its way all the way up to the Hawaii Supreme Court. And on Halloween of 2023, uh, the Hawaii Supreme Court came out with a unanimous decision affirming the denial of the motions for motions to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction. Um, and what Avi was alluding to was a concurring opinion by uh, Justice Todd Eddins that um, I think people have a lot of ways of describing it. I, I would describe it as a brilliant uh, concurring opinion that uh, calls to task um, the United States Supreme Court and sort of their views and, and the trends that been that they've been moving towards in terms of constitutional interpretation, because there are some federal constitutional issues that have been raised in the arguments regarding uh, personal jurisdiction. So I'll stop there, lay, lay the context, and then let others okay. jump Okay. Yeah, it's, I, I read this, Louise, I thank you for uh, sharing this. But when I, I, I read this, it actually was kind of emotional to read it because you know, I know Justice Eddings, Eddings well. I've seen him in practice, uh, and I I know a little bit about the the heart and the passion for for justice that he brings to the table. And to be in this position where you're called upon to make 
a seriously critical comment about how our Supreme Court is operating is, is, is pretty serious stuff. And I think it's something that for most of us who are, you know, are, are, are trained in the, in the jurisprudence that we are, that's generally not something that you do. Um, and so it just raises questions to me about where on earth are we uh, when it comes to to our Supreme Court? It's 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 actually it's 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 heartfelt, but it's troubling to me. That's my that was my 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 feeling about it, and it's something that and of course it's brilliant, and of course Judge Justice Evans is of course brilliant. We know that, but yeah, that's what I felt. Louise. Well, it really made my day when um, one of my colleagues circulated to us in the office Justice Eden's um, concurring opinion in that case with a wowza uh, comment, and I have to agree. And it really, I, I guess it, it what it did is it encapsulated for me my concerns of where the current Supreme Court is going. Um, you know, their systematic chipping away of basic civil rights that we all have. Um, assumed were um, enshrined in law for the past 50 years. And um, I started highlighting what the, the language that I really needed, but I have a, it's practically a yellow highlighted opinion. But I, I think, uh, you know, maybe just to read some examples of where I thought mm -hmm. it was wonderful how he used this, you know, sort of dull civil, um, civil procedure issue of personal jurisdiction to just really um, pound the um, concept of originalism that has been prevalent in our current Supreme Court. And I loved his opening lines about how enduring law is imperiled, emerging law is stunted, a justice's personal values and ideas about the very old days suddenly control the lives of present and future generations. Recently, the Supreme Court erased a, per a constitutional right it recalled autonomy and empowered states to force birth for one reason and one reason only, because the composition of this court has changed. And then it ends with a statement that the United States Supreme Court could use a little aloha after discussing what that. the concept of aloha, aloha is and why um, we, the courts in this state, need to keep those values in mind. So I thought it was a beautiful opinion and kudos to Justice Evans. Kudos. Indeed, and it's uh, rare for a judge to be this direct, and he did it yes. beautifully. The language is terrific. There are a couple mm -hmm. of things that are funny. Uh, the leading case that he was talking about is International Shoe, and so he said, for now, International Shoe still fits, but mm -hmm. who knows, because <laughs> everything change. seems to be up for grabs. And I've got to say, they're not really doing originalism. They claim they are. And as he points out, this is the U.S. Supreme Court we're talking about. As he points out, originalism as a theory is supposed to restrain judges. But these justices are completely unrestrained. And the abortion decision is just stunning in its, I got to get there, I don't care how, and I'll throw everything up there. Uh, and it's inconsistent with what that justice has written, what the court has said, what precedent says. And they just wanted to get there. And the next day, or maybe the day before, within 24 hours, is the gun case, and they do almost the exact opposite, except they claim to be doing history in both cases, and they're not. And of course, if they were doing history, there's a deep problem, which is, who are those framers back in Philadelphia? Right. Well, they're only white men, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. They weren't very concerned about gender issues or race issues in 1787, 1791, 1868. Well, I'm not even a person at that time. Right. In 1868, is similarly not concerned about gender and to the extent that they were concerned about race. And this is the new Justice Jackson's point. If you want to do originalism, you got to pay attention to what they were caring about, what they mm -hmm. meant to do. And what they meant to do was protect former slaves. That's mm -hmm. clear. And that's using race affirmatively, if you will. And that's exactly where the court went in the other direction, in the affirmative action case about college admissions. So I think, Todd, hats off, even though I'm wearing one right now. Uh, and it's really rare for a judge to be this direct. And uh, I really think it's gutsy and very impressive. Well, you had mentioned that there was uh, quite a bit of uh, buzz on campus uh, with our law students. And I'm really interested in 
hearing what 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 that was because now no no Avi you're 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 teaching constitutional law and this makes it very challenging and 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 difficult to kind of convey the principles that we've all come to think comprised the study of constitutional law how do you do it now and what well, are, I, how are students a, responding it's a great question and i've been saying probably each of you privately it's really hard to do with a straight face these days if you care about it then look what they're doing and you don't want the students to be cynical so uh yeah while while went around here too louise uh, when it mm -hmm. went around and, and troy is closer to some of that than i am so troy what was the reaction of your yeah, colleagues, no, it, it was, our colleagues? It was, yeah no it was very much the same thing and this was circulating among faculty members but also among the students the students have just finished actually learning about personal jurisdiction so the first year students so this was something that was they were very familiar with I had my students read the case at the beginning of the term because the Supreme Court had oral arguments. I had no thought that this was going to be decided during, you know, within two months of the oral argument. And so it was more of a thought piece for students to just keep an eye on this case. Um, and so students were well aware of this. I think there was a lot of pride, too. Justice Eddins is a proud Richardson. Yeah, girl. yeah. <laughs> so there was a lot of pride around campus, like, hey, the, this is one of our our justice is going out there and doing what C.J. Richardson sort of envisioned 50 years ago from mm -hmm. our graduates, right? And so it was sort of, for me, like a full circle moment in that C.J.'s vision is actually coming alive where our court is using our court, right, and, and decisions we have, but also to push the federal system, right, and to be very clear and call out the federal Supreme Court justices, some of them, on the ways in which they are approaching analyzing these these cases that come before them. One of C.J. Richardson's favorite stories was about talking to Justice Brennan, and C.J. Richardson did different things from what the established law was and said in Hawaii, why should we just use Anglo-American common law? We have our own traditions, our own law, and let's use some of that Native Hawaiian law. And Justice Brennan told him, don't wait for us, do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, of Louis, course he did. Louis touched, and on, Louis touched on it too that there, you know, Justice Eden cited the Aloha statute, right, mm -hmm. which is something unique to our jurisdiction, uh, but it is a guiding principle that I think is really important for all of our leaders here in Hawaii to follow, and they do follow it. But I've never seen so much kind of teeth put into that provision mm -hmm. like it was in this particular concurring opinion, which gives me confidence actually that perhaps there's going to be more of an effort to use that law to call out certain government conduct, misconduct in the future. Because mm -hmm. we're seeing an awful lot of that as well. That's another issue to be addressed is this whole concept of, I mean, civility. I mean, my God, it's it's sort of like the the, the, the backbone, I think, of what, what we've seen in this state for so many years um, for those, you know, in, in, in the practice that's kind of been there. But my goodness gracious, you, you had fisticuffs in Congress yesterday nearly. Well, I... <laughs> someone as someone said you know they're behaving like middle st school students except this gives middle school students a bad name they don't deserve yeah 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 indeed but it's so i have a question for the constitutional scholars and so i, I love how judge eddins looks to the values in hawaii but does that then embolden other states to say, well, we have our own values um, and we need to read federal law in light of those values? Hopefully they have good values, but you know, given what's happening in some of the states, I wonder, what's your thinking about that? Well, a little understood part of constitutional law, and this is part, I think, of what Justice Brennan was telling C.J. Richardson, mm -hmm. uh, you can use the state constitution and you can use it to expand rights. Uh, and that's what's beginning to happen in a lot of states. I think we, in many uh -huh. ways, are the leaders in Hawaii in doing that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but that's really a very fruitful, fertile and further oriented way of looking at the law. And we're having uh, Justice Eddins and S Justice Sabrina McKenna teach state constitutional law. Uh, mm -hmm. So this right. is playing into what is has been long time possibility, but not much used. Yeah, and parallel to that, too, if if I can add, is, you know, I've been thinking through this with the rise of originalism, particularly in the U.S. Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Aside from helping our students realize that constitutional law is both federal and state, 
do we have to teach and i'm putting on my i'm the chair of the curriculum committee here at the faculty <laughs> like do I, do we have to teach our students history like how to use history and mm -hmm. actual history american history if they're going to understand how to use and make these arguments if those are the arguments that these justices are going to be most persuaded by and i think the answer is yes but do we how do we do that in a way that you know represents sort of the actual history that may or may not be told by a majority of the Supreme Court. Exactly. And whose history are we and whose history are we sharing yeah. is the next question, because there's that movement as well. Uh, so that's an interesting question. One of and particularly great... here in Hawaii, there's, yeah, whose history? Exactly. Whose history are we talking about? And one of the great advantages of this opinion is that there are a few citations that people really have to follow up. And one of them is to the magnificent Judge Reeves, who's a black judge in Mississippi, a federal mm -hmm. judge. And mm -hmm. on this question, once the court started doing what it's been doing in recent years, he said, I'm not qualified as a historian. And so he assembled a panel of historians to advise the court. I think that's a great move. Not to all historians, as, as Judge Sims pointed out, they don't all agree, but you get a sense from them, at least of where the flashpoints are what the disagreement, uh -huh. disagreements about, and that judges are used to so if we're lucky enough to have a, a glass almost completely full in our supreme court and one that is rapidly leaking toward zero liquid in dc except for fortunately justice brown jackson justice sotomayor and maybe to a little bit lesser extent, less vocal, Justice Kagan. And it's interesting, right? Three of the four women on the court seem to be what the most wonderful woman I've ever known, who happened to be my mom, a small town, Northern Louisiana, independent, progressive woman, do. They stand up for what matters, for who matters, for those who are most vulnerable, most harmed. Justice Eden's opinion may give us some confidence and certainly inspiration and incentive for his colleagues and for other judges to do that. Do we see other examples of that anywhere, Avi? I think it's starting to happen in many places. And I, I, I think we have to be fair to uh, Chief Justice Reckonwald's opinion too which is a kind of straight down the middle, very important decision in its own right. Uh, and it's longer uh, by far, it's very careful, but it says this, this suit can go forward. And that in itself is actually pathbreaking in a case like yeah. this. this yeah. The first time in the yeah. country that this kind of suit, which is sort of modeled on the big tobacco litigation and so on, has moved forward. And that's mm -hmm. a major moment. Yes. It'll be interesting to see what other um, state Supreme Courts will be doing. I'm sure they're going to be looking at this and, and examining particularly uh, Todd's, Justice Eden's um, concurrence because, I mean, they get together and kind of, you know, see what things they can agree on and, and not. I mean, that's, that's part of, you know, that's part of their work as well. So then you're going to maybe see some, some other courts, other Supreme Courts really taking a closer look at how they use their own state constitutions in interpreting these issues. And that's maybe, we'll maybe push the Supreme Court, well, maybe not. <laughs> well, aren't, maybe not. <laughs> and aren't we seeing that spirit and those values in not only constitutional cases, but for example, the J.B. Nutter foreclosure case, where the court found that the actions of a lender who clearly, wrongfully, unethically, dishonestly, dispossessed a wonderful Hawaiian gentleman from his home by means of a reverse mortgage and their mm -hmm. twisting of a repair provision for which they were holding twice the amount necessary to make the repairs. And he did make the repairs before the case was over. But they used all that to basically take his home from him, render him homeless. And Justice Rechtenwald, one of, I believe, if not the best Supreme Court justice in this country, has stood up and got a unanimous opinion, wrote a unanimous opinion, 
basically not, he couldn't give him back his home. It had already been sold. But he said this was fraud on the court. It was wrongful foreclosure. And the only question is the amount of damages to this unfortunate gentleman. That is standing up for the people and the value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that is, to me, very consistent with Justice Eden's constitutional opinion. And what I believe Justice Brown Jackson, Justice Sotomayor, and I hope Justice Kagan will continue to urge and press. And, and they may not awaken any of the right wing colleagues on there. I, I don't know that there's much to awaken. But what pathways? Avi, Troy, Sandra, Louise, do you see toward countering that pernicious and dishonest and unethical trend of those six majority right-wing justices? One of the reasons that Louise is such a very successful lawyer is she keeps quiet most of the time. <laughs> so I'd like to hear what Louise has to oh, say no. first. <laughs> I was hoping to hear from you folks. Well, I, I think it does show that the import, you know, the importance of state supreme courts and state law um, remains critical. Um, if we're not going to be able to depend on the Supreme Court of the United States, then um, it, you know, change has to happen at the more local and state level, um, and that includes voters and education. Um, a, a recent example, two things that come to mind is that even our red states, we cannot write off. I remember hearing a interview by um, Representative Marcus Flowers, I think on Stephen Colbert about, you know, how, how about Florida and being a Democratic representative in a red state. And he goes, you, you know, it's not all red. Um, you know, there uh -huh. are pockets, uh -huh. there are movements and there is a, you know, there are progressives in there that are working towards um, increasing their influence. Um, I was just at a National Asian Pacific Bar Association conference in Indianapolis and I have to say it exceeded my expectations because one, I decided to go to Indianapolis because I figured when else will I ever go there? Why would I want to go there? Um, but I thought it was just really reaffirming. What they did is they decided if we're going to be in a red state and there were talks about boycotting that uh, venue and it was a very controversial decision, mm. then you know we got our, our Asian American partner involved there um, and the planners really made a point to reach out to Asian American LGBT communities and get them involved in the programming and make them feel like they're not alone, that they have allies uh -huh. and they can build coalitions. And sort of the informal theme was show up. And every plenary session dealt with LGBT issues, LGBT spe speakers, um, and just that whole effort to educate and make people feel like, yes, there are good things happening, um, you know, that there's good things happening in the next generation and there are ways that we can support um progressive uh -huh. and civil rights in our country despite all this discouraging news and the childish behavior going on um in congress very true so sandra how do we connect what's happening in the courts with that kind of solidarity that louise is just talking about well i have to agree i think it's it's happening uh, it's just that we're not aware of it. We don't get to see it. Um, but I, 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 and I think that's, and that's, that's a, that is kind of how we operate in terms of how media promotes things. You have to sort of be in these, in these, in these uh, uh, kinds of conferences so you can really see what's happening on the ground. I think that's happening in a lot of communities. I mean, just look at Ohio with just this last you know, issue with regard to abortion. We're all hyped up thinking, yes, it's going to be this. And then it turns out to, you know, why don't we ask the people and they come up with something very, very different. Um, so I I do believe in that process and I believe that on the ground, that is what is happening. We tend to focus on national media and particularly people's perspectives when, you know, there's some wisdom within our communities. There's wisdom you know, in our in our law school, really, I, you know, I, I didn't go to Richardson, but I'm, 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 I'm really proud to see what comes out of there. I sat up on the bench for many years, and so, so many of the graduates that are coming out of out of that law school are really making the statement of what the intent of the school was when C.J. Richardson envisioned what what would be taking place in our state, and they're really doing that. And I'm particularly 
pleased to see that. That's hopefully that's happening in other places as well. Uh, so I, I remain hopeful, Chuck. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm remaining hopeful in this generation to come, in the wisdom of of just smart people all around. They're there. They don't need to come out and they're not coming out and making speeches, but they're there, and they're doing what they need to do so, in their communities. Yeah, no, that's all. for for me, Chuck. The it comes down to education. Um, yeah. It comes down to elections, right? Like voting. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to getting all of this starting with kids, right? Mm -hmm. Working on civic education efforts to yeah. get kids involved and in understanding things like the rule of law, mm -hmm. uh, getting law students to understand the importance of participatory democracy, getting them to understand the rule of law, getting them to understand the nuances, getting them to understand history, right? Because what's happening at the US Supreme Court it actually did kind of happen overnight, but it was a long process that was plotted out over decades, right? This, you know, you had three justices all of a sudden show up on the court within a matter of a few years, but this wasn't an isolated thing, right? This was a well-constructed strategic effort to change things from the top down. And so I think focusing from the bottom up, right, and focusing on kids and getting kids the resources the education they need particularly in civics is for me is is i think the key mm -hmm. and, and yeah. troy mm -hmm. is a great exhibit a for exactly what he yeah. just talked yeah. about mm -hmm. yeah uh, so justice yeah. sotomayor was asked by erwin chimarinsky the dean at berkeley basically the question of how do you keep going and she said people have died for these rights people were beaten for these rights it's not open to us not to fight for them and she said mm -hmm. further I agree that the arc bends towards justice, but sometimes it bends very slowly. She said it was 100 years between Dred Scott and Brown versus Board of Education. So you got to not expect immediate victories. It's the long game. So which groups and institutions like the National Asia, I'm sorry, the National Association, Asian American. Napaba, yeah. yeah. Napaba. Yeah, Napaba. Yeah. <laughs> Which groups and institutions uh, offer the best vehicles, resources, uh, motivation, values to lead this uh, consolidation, this solidarity, this co coalescence and coalition? So I can give one example. Um, again, a shout out to the Hawaii Supreme Court. They created yeah. a a commission to promote and advance civic education. And so this was, and ironically, it was created the day after the January uh, riots, 2021 riots at the US Capitol. Um, but it was created to push out efforts to schools for civic education. So for me, I think that's one natural, connecting it back yeah. to our, sort of the, our yeah. progressive Hawaii Supreme Court, right? They're on, on top of these things and and trying to get out there. So they're one or, that's yeah. one organization. Yeah. yeah. And courts yeah. in the community, great project. I've gotten to participate yeah. in that. Getting into those classrooms with the high school students who are really both the soil and the the plants, the flowers that are going to generate the nutrient for that solidarity, for that movement. It's it's inspiring, really. Yeah. Actually, it is. That was one of the things that came out of the you know, the racial equity series at the Supreme Court uh, for, put put on as well uh, a couple of years ago. And that was one of the things that was really emphasized was working with with young people, having programs in high schools. And so the court, the court has done that as well. They they do their hearings in, in, in high schools sometimes. So, and around the island. And I think that's an important thing to for young people to see uh, for this institution that we revere and we regard so highly for it to be open to relating to to the young people, to high schoolers. I know yeah. when I was coming along, that was just unheard of. I mean, that would never have occurred in in Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> in so, Chicago, I don't think we'd ever see this. <laughs> just so we're we're almost, we're in almost the high out of time, <laughs> or we're maybe out of time, but Louise, last words? Um, well, I think th uh, that goes, what Troy said goes to the importance of ju judiciary, not just as, um, arbiters of a case, but just being able to advance initiatives to uh, for social justice, 
um, this, this, you know, the state, the state judiciary has done that in federal court. We're seeing judges um, like Leslie Kobayashi, Judge Leslie Kobayashi promote educational programs um, mm -hmm. on civil rights and history. So I think that those are very, are, those are bright lights. Javi, last words? Well, I don't want to leave out my chance to brag about the law school. We do a lot of programs, and one of them, which has not been much publicized, is every summer we have a free justice camp, free for public high school students from lots of different high schools. And within one week, they learn enough to put on a quite uh, presentable trial themselves. And we have a lot of involvement with that from our faculty. And we uh, give them a free lunch. There is such a thing as a free lunch. <laughs> Joy, last words? Uh, thanks for putting this together, Chuck. This was a great conversation. I would just love to, again, send a shout out to our Hawaii Supreme Court. Uh, we got, I think, two more justices coming up. I, I, I don't yeah. see any issues with the confirmation, but, you know, we're going to have a full court, full steam ahead, ready, I think, to do some really awesome work for us. And we in Hawaii should be really, really yes. proud of our, yes. of our state Supreme Court. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and that's that may be a good place to wind up. And I want to, and I think it's appropriate to mention them by name. And I have to admit to being a little choked up because in visualizing each of them, the spirit, the heart, the conscience, the values each of them brings is impeccable. It's just, it's pinnacle level. So Chief Justice Reckonwald, in my view, the best in the country. <laughs> Justice McKenna. Justice Edens, Justice Devins, Justice Ganoza. I would not trade any of those five for anybody anywhere else. They are that commendable, that admirable, and that believable and trustworthy. Thank you all for contributing to this and honoring them, the spirit, the values they bring and share with us. And you do in your classes, Louise, in your work, Sandra, in your writing, and hopefully, to some extent, in my mediation. Mm -hmm. Aloha. Thank you all so Aloha. much. Aloha. Thanks for pulling us together.